Was für uns das Rücken in Lände war? She's not standing up. <laughs> then, then, you know, 53 years of stuff all around in there, I had to actually get the right button to, to sing. It's like, oh, that's right, we're not doing well. <laughs> A memory like an elephant, I tell you. A really old, rusted one, but still an elephant. Well, last week, this was a sermon that I had prepared, but we changed because we were uh, deciding whether we were going to show that video. Did anybody remember that video that we showed? Yes. yes. Okay. Did you enjoy the video? Yes. Yeah, there was good information, and that's why uh, Gary and I wanted to share that with the congregation. And again, I just wanted to take this opportunity again to thank Janet for all the work that she put in to uh, get into the time limit that she did. But I want to talk to you this morning about one of my favorite subjects, and that is how God sees you, and that is through His eyes. We talked about this in my Sabbath school class. Do you know what the difference between human love and God's love is? God's love is called what in Scripture? Agape. Ricky preaches on this a lot, agape. Okay? Agape love is selfless love. Okay? It's not tainted with any type of selfishness at all. Well, let me ask you a question. When God created Adam and Eve, fresh from his hands, what kind of love did he instill in them? Agape love. They had selfless love. Adam's desire was for the betterment of his wife. Eve's desire was for the betterment of her husband. And both of their desires were for knowing God more and more. There was not a taint of selfishness in them. They had the image of God. How many of you know what the actual image of God that you were created in is? It is this agape love. Because that is what Adam and Eve lost when they sinned. And this is what Jesus Christ has come to restore in us. Agape love. Our text this morning is taken from 1 John. And 1 John says, Behold what manner of love the Father has given or bestowed unto us. Now I want you to think about this. Because sometimes we don't contemplate this idea enough. And that is that you really are called a child of God. Do you know what that actually means and entails? Does anybody here have an adopted child? Or, or a child that came from uh, a stepchild? There you go. Anybody have a stepchild? Yeah. Okay. So, those of you who either came from a family where you were the stepchild or you're, you have stepchildren now, you will have a better understanding of what this means that you have been called the children of God. Now, in the world that we live in, as imperfect as it is, sometimes it is very hard to be the stepchild because they know exactly where they stand in the hierarchy of the family. But every once in a while, you get that family where the mother and the father love that child exactly like their own children. An adopted child, they can love them even more. And this is how God sees us. That we are His children. Now, didn't you ever find it kind of funny that Jesus said that you, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children. How many of you, when your child asks for a piece of bread, you give him a what? A stone. A stone. <laughs> now, think about that. We are evil. It is what our natures have become when Adam and Eve fell. Do you guys understand that? Because this is something that, from my experience, most people in any church you talk to have no conception of the true reality of this. Because they think of themselves, oh, I'm not that bad. <laughs> oh, look at our world, I'm not that bad. <laughs> but you understand you're judging yourselves against the world. 
and you judge yourself against other people, you may not be bad at all. But is that what God's judgment is about? You need to understand this, that when God judges you, you are judged according to His level. Perfect law and order. Okay? When, when God looks at you, God judges you according to His righteousness. And how righteous is God? All righteous. He's all righteous. He's perfect, right? Now, can you imagine being a step-parent to a child that was just horrible and wicked and loving that child with a love that we can't even comprehend? Because that's how God sees you. Okay? That's how much God loves you. And that when He sees you, He doesn't see the sinner. He sees His own son. But now listen, we say that all the time. I say that all the time. But what I want you to understand is when He sees you, He doesn't just say, Jesus, stand in front so that when I look at Patty, I don't really see her, I see you, and then everything will be okay. When God looks at you, He sees you, all that you are, all that you've done, all that you're going to do, and He has a love that is endless. And He sees the potential of what you can become. And that's what God wants from each and every one of us. To be able to fill that potential of what He created us to be. That can only be done through a relationship with His Son, Jesus Christ. Because in our own natures, outside of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, what our potential is, is dark and sinister and ugly. Okay? Now think about that. You know people like that. And you probably stay away from people like that. But yet God came and searched us out. <laughs> Not only did He search us out, but He became one of us. Have you grasped that yet? That God humbled Himself and took on human flesh. The flesh of your fathers. And your father's 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 father. And took that on to become one with you because he's not ashamed to call you a brother or a sister. So turn with me again to 1 John. First John chapter 3. We look at verse 1. Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us, that we should be called children of God. Therefore the world does not know us, because it did not know Him. Beloved, now, what does it say? We can be? Or now we might be? It's emphatic. Now we are. Never forget that. See, because the devil will keep whispering in your ear, no, you're not. No, you're not. This is why you have to read and know your Bibles. Because the devil says one thing, and God's Word will say another. God's Word says we are the children of God. So let's never forget that. Never forget what God has done for you. And never forget why He's done it for you. He's done it because of His endless love just for you. Amen. See, it doesn't do me a lot of good to think, well, God loves the world and He'd do it for anybody. <laughs> he'd save a turtle if He had to. What you have to think about is God came to save you. Because when you entered this world and you took your first breath, you were a sinner condemned to die. Amen. You guys understand that, right? Amen. Again, most Adventists don't realize this, and most people, especially women, do not like to address this concept. Babies are not born innocent. Just stop feeding that baby when it's hungry and see what it does. Let that child grow to be two years old and give his sister a toy that it doesn't have and give him something he can grab and see him hit his sister. Okay? Babies aren't innocent. 
This is why God is able to, at certain points in this world's history, to say probation has ended. Go into this nation and destroy everything. Don't leave men, women, or alive. And God is righteous in doing that. Because God knows the beginning from the end. He knows that at a certain point in our iniquity, in our sinfulness, that babies will grow up to be even worse than their parents were. So, think about the God that loves you so much that He stepped in to save you from the moment of your birth. Think about that. All the days of your life, God has been with you. In great decisions and not so great decisions. In obedience and in disobedience, God is there and God is tugging on your heart to show you His love. Come back to me. Come back. Come back. I think it's good that God changes the heart and up in the I do too, Myron. You hear that? He thinks it's good that God changes the heart without making an incision. Because God is the only surgeon that can operate from the inside out. Amen. Right? Call it a sin and death to me. A sin and I like that. I like that. Verse 2 of 1 John chapter 3. Beloved, now we are the children of God. And it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. This is what the potential that you have to be in Jesus Christ. A true child of God. Do you think angels are powerful? Good angels. Okay? Good angels. You think they glow? Do they really glow? Are they bright? The Bible says yes. Now think of what kind of character that you can attain to in Christ. Brothers and sisters, we don't know that yet. It hasn't yet been revealed, but it will be. I told you this before, that when God made man, he made him lower than the angels, but when Christ redeemed man, he put him above the angels. Where you stand in your relationship with God and what you will be doing throughout eternity, what you can attain to, who you can be, a very child of God, I can't even put it in words. <laughs> It's not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when He is revealed, we shall what? Amen. See, I'll let the Bible say, because this is what I was going to tell you, but I don't want to be misunderstood. We are not gods. We will never be God. But we can be like Jesus Christ. Amen. Think about that. Jesus took on humanity, and He keeps humanity throughout eternity, and we can be like Him. Let your mind run wild on just what that means, what kind of potential that we have in Christ. Amen. We shall be like Him, for we shall see Him, what? Yes. You ever wonder why John says we shall see Him as He is? Listen, Paul made it plain that we see through a glass, what? But then... Who are we going to see face to face? Yes, he's not talking about us, that we'll see each other for who we really are face to face. We will see Jesus face to face. You ever wondered what he's like? A God? A real God who spoke universes into me. Who raised the dead who gave you life and a brain, who put this whole system together to allow it to work. And He spoke it. And you will see Him face to face. And not only see Him face to face, but you get to hang out with Him. Amen. And you will truly be His friend. How many of you have had the blessings of having a good friend? Okay. Throughout your life, when you're small, remember when you're small and you have like a lot of friends? You go through junior high, you still have a lot of friends. High school, you start to realize that you have friends and you have acquaintances. And once you get out of school, you realize you have a lot of acquaintances. And as the years go by, you start to realize you have a lot of acquaintances, but very few friends. 
And those friends are the ones that you know are there for you. They love you no matter what you've done, no matter what your past was. They know your past, and you can talk to them about that past. But they also know that you're not the same person, right? True friends. That is a relationship that you can have with Jesus Christ now. And it can be just as real as that friend that you're thinking about. That's what Jesus does for us. Okay? So, this agape love. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed unto us. Now, what does it mean that the Father has given or bestowed unto us? He's given us what? That love. So does it mean that you can actually have that love inside of you as well? How can I have an agape love when I am fleshly? To the indwelling of God, right? So listen. How do I get this love? The world says you can get it through education. You can learn your way to this kind of love. If you have enough money, you can buy your way into this kind of love. Can you do that? Nope. No. We can never hope by our own efforts to secure this kind of love. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 55. Isaiah 55, we're going to look at verses 1 through 3 and then 6 through 9. Isaiah 55. Now, I want you to think about this. What part of the Bible is this coming from? Old Testament or New Testament? So, if you still don't believe that there's only one way that man has ever been saved, and that's through a relationship with Jesus Christ, whether in Old Testament or the New Testament, because John made it plain. John was the last great prophet of the Old Testament. John the Baptist, right? The last great prophet of the Old Testament, Jesus said that. Right? When John saw Jesus, what did he say? Behold, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. He was talking about that during the still Old Testament era. But you don't have to go to John. All you have to do is go to Isaiah. Isaiah 55, verses 1 through 3. Verse 1 says, Ho, everyone who thirsts, comes to the waters. And you who have no what? Money. Come, buy and eat. What does that mean? If you have no money, you can still come. It means it's free, right? Do we not say that the gospel is a free gift? There it is. Old Testament. There, there has never been another way for fallen humans to be saved than by God's everlasting gospel. Amen. Coming of the Son, Jesus Christ. Everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you who can have no money, come, buy and eat. Yes, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not what? <laughs> Listen carefully to me and eat what is good. And let your soul delight itself in what? Is it really talking about wine and food? No. This is talking about the Spirit. And it is talking about a relationship with God. Why do you spend your hard-earned money on things that will not satisfy? Why do you try to work your way? Why do you try to educate your way? Why do you try to buy your way to something you can never buy? Come, I'll give it to you freely. Why? Because I agape you. That's Isaiah 1 through 3. Let's look at verses 6 through 9. Also the sons of the foreigner who joined themselves to the Lord to serve him and to love the name of the Lord to be his servants. Everyone who keeps from defiling the Sabbath, even them I will bring to my what? This is verse 7 of chapter... Oh, wait a minute. Hold on. Hold on. Yeah. Yeah, I'm in <laughs> this is Isaiah 55. Sorry, I was reading 56. Okay. 
Verse 6. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his what? Way. His way. And the unrighteous man his what? Thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, and the Lord will have what? Mercy on him. And to our God, for he will what? Abundantly pardon. Brothers and sisters, does that not sound like good news? What does the word gospel mean? Good news. This is the gospel in the Old Testament. Only God can forgive you of your sins. Only God can change your heart. And God says, let whoever wants to come, what? Come. It won't cost you nothing. And in the end, it'll cost you everything. Right? The paradox of the gospel. But in the end, if you know this Jesus Christ, you will be more than willing to give up anything and everything to be with Him and to know Him. Okay, so that was Isaiah. <laughs> Before I really knew Jesus Christ, I read this verse. And I asked myself, will God really forgive my sins? See, because I know my sins because I committed them. And I know sins that nobody else knows that I committed. Can he really forgive me of those? And, and I doubted that. Because being raised in the Catholic faith, I knew that God was holy. And I knew that God was just. And I knew that God's law was still binding on me as a person. And that he doesn't just wink at your disobedience. But what I didn't know is the love of God. And I did not understand that wherever I was, whatever I did, God was more than willing to forgive that. And God was waiting there with open arms, waiting for me to let Him work more and more in my heart. Now here you go, let me ask you a question. <coughs> Repentance, does it come from the sinner? Does it come from God? <coughs> So you understand, when I'm thinking these things, it wasn't even me that was actually producing that thought. It was the Spirit working inside of me to try to open my eyes. But what I needed to do was to submit to God. Amen. Right? What's the only thing I have total control of? Your and will. I said, yeah, I got you. What did you say? Your will. will. Your will. Right? Your will. Yeah. The only thing I have total control of is my will. <clears throat> Again, I'll give you the illustration of a child. A little child. A little child who wants something really bad, and you've told that child over and over again, no, you cannot have that. And the little child looks at you and plants its feet, and balls its fist up, and goes right ahead and does it right in front of you. Why? Because that child is in control of its will. Now, Let's, let's fast forward about 10 years, and now that child's a teenager, okay? And now that child still has total control of its will, and now you're butting heads over the test of wills. I'm the parent. You need to do what I say because I'm the parent, right? The child goes, I'm my own person. I'm going to do what I want to do. And this test of wills. Who wins? Well, you should have dealt with it 10 years ago. <laughs> That's only if you have a submissive child. How many of you raised, how many of you raised a strong-willed child? Does that work on a strong-willed child? No. Right? That's right. I understand that. So, this test of wills. Who usually wins? That's right, but in the end, it's the child. His will will win because he will do what he wants. I can remember telling my son, because he'd ask me, so if I do this, what's going to be my punishment? <laughs> Tell him what his punishment was, and you'd see him. Wait out. Taking it out. Wheels there. And then he'd do it. So, you know what I'm saying? Let me ask you a question. That's between you and your parent. How many of us still do that with God? Alright? Most of us are adults here. How many of us still do that with our Heavenly Father? Again, why? Because you still control your will. So you understand that, right? 
I'm not speaking blasphemy or heresy, right? You guys understand that. The will is what has to be consistently and constantly submitted to Christ. Your will can no longer be yours, but it has to be His. Now, do you understand that when you submit your will to His will, that God, it's like kind of like, a, remember those old, remember the old radios you had in your car that you had to actually tune the dial? Do you remember having those radios in your house? My grandmother had one of those radios. It's the coolest thing they ever played with. <laughs> try to get, because there'd be all kinds of numbers on it, and you try to get that thing to pick something up. You know what I'm saying? Just pick something up. In your car, same thing. Well, you are like that radio. That outside of a relationship with Jesus Christ, you are on the wrong channel. Okay? And so God's frequency and your frequency are two different things. But the Holy Spirit is consistently trying to tune you and tune you and tune you. And as you bring your heart to a submissive state with God, God now starts to use you and turn you and tune you to get you closer and closer to His frequency. Now, brothers and sisters, as you continue to grow in Christ, this is what we call sanctification. Sanctification is just God tuning you to be on His frequency. So that what now is in your heart is what has always been in His heart. And the two now have become one. Does that make sense to you guys? That is what a relationship with Jesus Christ does for us. It's not about, well, you know, if I give my heart to God, I can't do this. I can't do that. I can't hang out with these people no more. I can't eat this. I can't drink that. What it is about is understanding this heart of a God that has no taint of blackness, darkness, or selfishness in it. And He's now giving you that heart. And now, as you're on His frequency, you start to look around and see the people around you the way God does. And now you start to understand why you don't judge them. Why you don't have a critical spirit with them. But you start to see them as God sees them. And you start to have feelings of their well-being. That's agape, selfless love. A love that is poured out on others and not just poured into yourself. Does that make sense? Alright, well... Turn with me to Isaiah, chapter 1. Let's look at verse 18. How many of you are familiar with this verse? It says, Come now, let us what? Reason together. Though your sins be as what? What color is scarlet? <laughs> Have any of you ever had a... a uh, a red shirt go in a wash with your white clothes. <laughs> oh, yeah. And when the other clothes come out, what color are they? Pink. Can you get them white again? No. You can try with bleach, but what does bleach usually do to your clothes? <laughs> well, I, my wife said, don't use bleach. I didn't listen to her. Because <laughs> I exerted my own will. <laughs> Don't you, don't, don't you use bleach in my washing machine. But there's stains there that won't come out. Don't use bleach. He said, okay.